All right, today we're looking at Revelation chapters 15 and 16. Uh, we're grouping two chapters together for two or three reasons. One is they go together, and two, because we have more chapters than we have weeks, and we've got to start grouping some things together. And uh, thirdly, because 15 is a very short chapter. So we're going to look at these two chapters uh, today. We're in the second major section of the book, and we have covered the war section, 12 to 14, of this conflict going on behind the scenes is the reason for what's going on on earth. So in 15 and 16, that's where we are, have to do with the seven bowls of wrath. Next week, we'll look at 17 and 18, and that deals with the fall of Babylon the harlot. Um, and we are seeing a hint at that here in, uh, not a hint, but a, a very strong statement of that in 15 and 16. But we're looking at the seven bowls of wrath. So um, we have some contrast here before we look at what's on the screen, the sevens that are found here. There's, there's a contrast in 15 and 16 with the victory of the saints of God on the sea of glass in contrast to the judgment that's being executed upon their enemies in chapter 16 with the seven bowls being poured out. So you have that contrast repeated from other chapters. For example, chapter 7 gives us a picture of the victory of the 144,000, wherein chapters 8 and 9 have the sounding of the seven trumpets. And so you have those, the victory versus defeat in contrast. We saw the same thing in chapter 14. We saw the victorious lamb. And then in contrast to that, we saw the four voices, three angels and a voice from heaven, the fourth, concerning the uh, judgment that's coming upon those who are the enemies of God's people. You might say chapter 15 is an introduction to chapter 16. And we'll get to all of that here in just a second. Uh, we had seven seals, seven trumpets, and now we're looking at seven bowls. Uh, this is not original with me, but I think this summarizes the distinction the seven seals revealed God's judgment. In other words, the, the scroll was sealed with seven seals in, in chapter 5. And now we have the opening of the seven seals. And out of that seventh seal comes seven trumpets. Well, the seven trumpets warned of God's judgment. The seven bowls execute God's judgment. So all of the seven things that are mentioned in the book of Revelation point to the judgment upon the enemies of God's people, which is Rome, the Roman emperor, the Roman concilium. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to our questions for today before we get into chapter, uh, chapter 15. Um, yeah, question number one, what do the seven angels have with them? All right, seven plagues which involves seven bowls of wrath. Let's go and get question number two. Who are the people who are standing on the sea of glass? All right, yeah, God's victorious saints, the people of God. It's the same people of the hundred, that's 144,000. Uh, it's those who are faithful to God, those who've been faithful unto death. Um, Revelation 2 and in verse 10. Let's go and get question three. What is the song of Moses and the Lamb? All right, yes, the song of victory. Much similar to the concept we find in Exodus chapter 15. All right, here's chapter 15. We're going to take chapter 15 as separate, and then we'll deal with chapter 16 here in just a little bit. Spend more time in chapter 16. Only, we only have a few verses here uh, in chapter 15. Here we have the seven angels with the seven bowls of wrath. We're introduced to the bowls of wrath. So we have seven angels with seven plagues of wrath mentioned here in verse 1. So let's talk about verse 1. Uh, he said, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Now that would serve as a summary verse for the entire chapter. If you want to know what chapter 15 is about, read verse 15 and you've got a pretty good summary. So what he's saying here in verse 1 is there are seven angels that have seven bowls of wrath. 
And that suggests to us that the, the plagues of God or that the judgment of God is complete. Up to this point, it's been incomplete. How do I know that? The picture of judgment thus far has been an incomplete picture. Yeah, verse 1 now tells us complete. Back in chapter 6, the seals were on a fourth of the earth. And then there were the trumpets were upon a third of the earth. Chapter 8, verse 10. Chapter 8, verse 11. And, and verse 12. And 9 and 15. And 9 and 18. So here were these, the, the, uh, the, the seals and the, the trumpets were upon a portion of the earth. Meaning it was incomplete. It's not, it, it, the, it's not final. It's not complete. But here it is said to be complete. In other words, God's wrath is no longer partial. It's complete and uh, the judgment upon Rome is now ready to be executed. That's the point. All right, let's look at verses 2 to 4. The victorious saints on the sea of glass. We've been introduced to the sea of glass pr prior to this. In fact, the sea of glass was mentioned in chapter 4. In that throne scene, the sea of glass suggested that the throne of God was unapproachable. So here was the throne, but you cannot approach the throne because of the sea of glass. Let's, get, let's fast forward now and go to chapter 21, and in verse 1, there will be a time when there is no more sea. Now that's interesting. If the sea means that the throne of God is unapproachable, means we can't go there just yet, there's coming a time, Revelation 21, which I think is a picture of heaven, when there is no more sea. Uh, which means it's approachable. More about that when we get to chapter 21. So what is the picture here in verses 2 to 4? He saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and, on those, uh, and those who have the victory over the beast, and over his image, the mark of the beast, standing on the sea of glass having harps of God. What does that suggest to you? Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, they're going to be singing a song of victory, and it's, it's praise and victory, like Exodus 15. We'll come back to that here in a second. But let's look at the first part of verse 2. This is those who did what? They overcame the beast. Who was the beast identified in chapter 13? All right. The Roman emperor. He's one of the two beasts that mentioned there. There was the, the first beast, and then there was the second beast, which we identified as the... So here's the Roman emperor representing the Roman Empire. And overcame the image over his mark and over the number of his name. Remember the number being 666? All right, so they overcame the beast, they overcame the image of the beast, and they overcame the mark and the number of the beast. Which means what? Say again? All right, yeah, the, the number means failure. But if they overcame the beast, that means they were triumphant, they were faithful. I think this is a picture of saints already dead. What about those saints that were martyred, like Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful till death, to the point of death. What about those? John in a vision sees them standing on the sea of glass. Does that make sense? He sees this pic victorious picture. A.T. Robertson said this, he said, um, that this item, mentioning the fire is what he's talking about. There's fire mingled, uh, what is the wording there? Mingled with fire, standing on a sea of glass mingled with fire. This item, which is not mentioned in chapter 4, verse 6, which is a vision of peace, but is here added to the splendor of the vision. The parenthesis, 2 to 4, gives a picture of martyrs in their state of bliss. The fire may suggest something about the persecution that brought them to this state. They were persecuted and, they, and because they were burned at the stake, maybe that's the idea of that. I, I'm not, I cannot be for sure of that. But they overcame. In other words, they didn't compromise. So every saint that didn't compromise and they died, John sees in a vision standing on a sea of glass. Now let's go to 2 to 4. 2 to 4 talks about this song. What are they singing in the song? In fact, we have a question on that. Uh, question, I believe it's number 4. The different elements of praise there. What, what are they saying? All right, his, his works are great. He's praised as he's the Almighty God. 
He's also righteous and just and true. King of the nations. All men should fear him. He's holy. All, all nations should come and worship him. He's worthy of worship and his judgments have been manifested. In other words, uh, they praise God for his greatness, his power and his might and he executes judgment. So these, these saints that were faithful are standing on the sea of glass in our picture. John is able to see them through this vision, able to see them as standing victorious. Make sense? Now this reminds us of Exodus 15 because in Exodus as they came out of Egypt, there was the song of Moses, that is, they were singing a song of celebration of victory. And this is a celebration of victory. These saints are singing, we have been victorious. But I thought they were killed. How would you, what if you had a friend visiting with you, knows nothing about Revelation, and uh, they turn and ask you the question, I thought we were talking about people that were killed by the beast, by the Roman Empire, and yet you're describing them here in this text as being victorious, and they're praising God for being victorious. How, how do you harmonize that? They didn't buckle under the pressure. Didn't say they wouldn't die. We've made the point repeatedly, death in the sight of God is no big deal for God. Because precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Uh, and so life on earth is just temporary. And so he's saying, in essence, that they were victorious because they didn't bow to the pressure. They didn't cave to the pressure and they ultimately stand uh, victorious. No, they didn't bow down to the beast at all. All right, now let's go to verses 5 to 8. Seven bowls of wrath are given to these seven angels. So seven angels, verse 5, come out of the temple. Uh, verse 5 and 6 said, Behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of the Lord was open, and out of the temple came seven angels having seven plagues clothed in bright linen. Um, now, Barnes suggests, for what it's worth to us, that they're not coming out of the temple proper, but out of the sanctuary of, uh, sanctuaries of the temple. In other words, but it doesn't have reference to the building of the temple as a whole, but to the Holy of Holies. Um, and suggesting by that, maybe, and we cannot be dogmatic about some of our interpretation, that this scene is supposed to remind them that God hasn't forgotten his people because this is called the witness of uh, the, uh, the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven. Uh, one translation says the witness of the uh, testimony of heaven. In other words, uh, coming out of the temple reminds them, reminds the people who received, that God hadn't forgotten his people. Here's this victory scene of the saints. God hadn't forgotten his people. There's more yet to come, and the, the seven bowls of wrath are going to, to suggest that. Now, notice the appearance of these uh, angels. They're clothed in bright linen, having their chest girded with golden bands. What might that impress you with? If they're coming out of the temple, and they're dressed brightly, all right? Which means, yeah, they're on a divine mission. These are from God. They're on a divine mission. So this seven bowls of wrath, the angels are pouring out, is not something God is against. In fact, God's in favor of that. These are executing God's mission, is the idea. They're coming from God. Uh, then one of the seven, point uh, B there, verse 7, one of the four living creatures gave seven bowls of wrath. And... Uh, Notice at verse 7, these were the bowls of wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Now why would there be a mention of God living forever and forever? We know that, but what would that suggest here in the context of this book? Yeah, yeah, the, this is the wrath of God being poured out. The God who lives forever and forever, the Roman emperor which they feared, is not going to live forever and forever. In fact, the chapter 15 and 16 are talking about him falling. Make sense? There's a contrast to be made. Then finally, verse 8, the temple was filled with the smoke of God. Uh, the tabernacle was filled at the dedication of the tabernacle, Exodus 40. The temple in 1 Kings 18 was, was filled with the smoke of the glory of God. <clears throat> and so um, 
the smoke remains until the, until the uh, seven bowls of wrath or God's plague is fully executed. But notice what the, the statement made in verse 8. The temple was filled and, and that no one was able to enter the temple till the seven, uh, till the seven angels, the plague, seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Uh, the time has come for this judgment to be executed. There's no time for intercession. The day of repentance is gone. The time to execute God's wrath is here. That's the point of chapter 15. So let's go to our questions one more time here before we leave this chapter. Uh, question number uh, six. What's the point of chapter 15? When you walk away from 15, in one sentence this chapter is saying, no more time. Here's the victory of God's people in contrast to God executing His judgment on Rome. Not in final judgment, but in time. Judgment in time, the fall of Rome. Make sense? We see the picture, the victory of God's people in contrast. All right, let's go to chapter 16 now. Any questions or comments on 15 before we go? Now we've got more to cover in chapter 16. Now in chapter 16, we have the seven bowls of wrath that we introduced to us in chapter 15. And so basically our outline is seven points, seven bowls. What do they mean? Well, we'll get to that here in a second. Verse 1 says that he heard a loud voice. The time for judgment has come. The number seven suggests the judgment is complete. Now the difficulty comes in identifying each one of these in detail to say that I know for sure the first bowl means this and cannot mean anything else, and the third bowl means this and it cannot mean anything else, and the seventh bowl means this and cannot mean anything else. It's difficult. But when we get through, we can know these two things are true. So remember these two points. Number one, the seven bowls are God's judgment upon Rome that will bring it down. Now when we get through, let, let's go through the chapter, and if all we got from it, we saw, okay, there was a first bowl, second bowl, third bowl, and now, down, now the seventh bowl. All right, these bowls of wrath are poured out. And when we get through, you say, I don't know what any of those bowls mean, but I know this, that every one of those suggests some judgment God brought up on Rome that brought it down, We've accomplished something. I don't have to know what each one of them are. Does that make sense? I can't be dogmatic. But secondly, here's the second thing we know. We know some things that brought Rome down historically. For example, we know that natural disaster brought it down. We know that internal rottenness, that is, it decayed from within. And thirdly, external invasion. So those three are embedded in this somewhere. So you say, well, where, where does that fit? Well, I can, I can give you some, uh, as, as one guy says, an educated guess of what, where it fits, but I cannot be dogmatic. Make sense? And so I'm going to make some suggestions that the first bowl probably represents, and the second bowl probably represents, I can't be dogmatic. And if you say, well, I think it means something else, fine, I'm not going to argue the case because I'm not sure I can't. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll move on uh, from that. Ray Summers made this point. He said, no attempt to determine the special meaning of the objects thus visited by the wrath of God, land, sea, rivers, and sun have yet been or ever likely to be successful. The general effect of God's ret final retribution, wrath, alone appears to be important. That's the point I made earlier. While that is certainly true, we will make some suggestions along the way. In other words, we're going to make some suggestions, but we cannot be dogmatic, and that's the point I was trying to make. All right. This reminds us, the seven bowls of wrath, it, just a cursory reading of that reminds you of something. There's some language here that automatically makes you think of Egypt. Yeah, the plagues upon Egypt. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll call our attention to some of those as we go along. Verse 1 would be a key verse. Let's talk about the first bowl found in verse 2. What happens in the first bowl as it's poured out? All 
All right. Yeah, verse 2. He poured out his bowl on the earth, and it caused a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Well, two things happened. It caused a foul and loathsome sore, and it was upon those that, that worshipped the beast. Let's talk about this word foul. Your New, New King James footnote will say, nobody has it, bad or evil. You know, maybe yours is not updated. Um, they're updated every year, you remember. Uh, the New King James is anyway. So depending on what year you have. Uh, you're severe and malignant. Severe and malignant. Uh, in sores on man and beast, perhaps alluding to that concept. Um, and so he calls this, and, and it's upon those who worship the beast. Uh, probably that refers to corruption breaking out within the nation. And that may allude to that e e internal rottenness of sin decaying the nation. You say, no, I think it represents, and you fill in the blank, have at it. But there is, there's something about this word sore and loathsome, the evil and the activity of evil that causes this nation to fall. That was part of the bowls of wrath. Now, let's stop and footnote and make a practical application. Is there any danger when a nation starts deteriorating morally? Righteousness exalts, but somebody had it back there. Yeah, sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach. When, when a nation is given over to corruption and to evil, and it starts deteriorating morally, guess what's going to happen to the nation? It's finally going to fall. It happened to Rome. Um, so something that God could use, even their own evil, God could use it to destroy the nation, destroys the moral fiber of the nation. That probably is what this refers to. But whatever it refers to is God executes wrath and brings Rome down by the loathsome and the foul sword. Let's go to the second bowl. The second angel did what? That obviously reminds us of the plagues. Uh, and so the sea became blood and the creatures of the sea died, according to verse 3. That probably refers to, uh, the sea often is, is referenced, uh, refers throughout um, Old Testament and the book of Revelation to the mass of humanity, uh, Revelation 13, 1, Daniel 7. And it probably refers to the, to the society, again, being given over to a life of sin, being dead in sin, uh, maybe what it has reference to. Listen to Haley. I mean, quote from Haley. Uh, the sea creatures died as a result and so what he's suggesting is that here, as sin permeates a society, it has a devastating effect. Probably the same thing as the first bowl. Haley said this, a society abandoned to idolatry and its consequent morals, as well as the Roman Empire of John's day, is spiritually dead. In such a society, morals decline to the lowest level. The family collapses, school breed anarchy and rebellion. Business ethics are forgotten. Entertainment becomes base and sordid. The printing presses exude smut and filth until the whole is strangled in its own death blood and suffocated in its own stench. Our society too must listen to the trumpet warning before God pours out the bowls of wrath. Do you think the picture of Rome sounds anything like America? There's a lot of parallels. A lot of parallels. Anything else on the, the sea? Uh, second bowl being poured out on the sea.
or interesting point. And, and the, the reader being familiar, I mean the reader, the recipient of the, of the book of Revelation has to be familiar with, with Exodus and would be familiar with Exodus and that's going to ring a bell that here is a consequence that came upon a nation that was the enemy of God's people. If that's all they got, they know that much. All right, let's go to the third bowl being poured out, verses 4 to 7. More space is given to this. What do we have in this one? All right. Yeah, he poured it out on the river and the springs and it became blood. And I heard an angel saying. So here's angel, plural, praise God in verses 5 to 7. What the first one say? The angel of the waters. Five and six. All right. Say more about that in a moment. The second angel, the angel from the altar, what do he say? Pretty much the same thing. This must be uh, pointing to some kind of uh, divine retribution, divine justice. Because notice these phrases. Look at verse 5. Um, verse 5, you are righteous. God is righteous, in other words, in his judgment. Uh, look at verse 6. God is giving uh, some their just due. And then verse 7, the angel of the altar said, you are true and righteous, are true and righteous are your judgments. So both of these angels, the one of the waters and the one of the altar, are praising God for his just and righteous judgment, divine retribution. So when we get through, all of this has to do with divine retribution, but this must be focusing on as this bowl of wrath is being poured out, that this is divine retribution. That when this nation falls, God's bringing it down. It's not just the nation collapsed and God's kind of wondering, I wonder what happened here. God's the one that brought it down. And he's going to see that it's brought down. All right, let's go to the fourth bowl. What happens at the fourth bowl? Verses 8 and 9. All right. Yeah, two things happen here. The scorched men with fire and then the men who were scorched. Here's the description of them in verse 9. So let's talk about verse 8. The idea of scorching uh, the sun or pouring it out on the sun and giving power to scorch men. What does that suggest to you? Say again. All right, it's intensified. Yeah, this, is, this is some kind of judgment, but it's a judgment upon those who worship the beast. In other words, we saw in chapter 15, we saw this victory of the saints who overcame the beast, but here are those who bowed to the beast, those who caved to the pressure. What happened to them? Well, a bowl of wrath is being poured out, and there was power given to scorch men with fire. In other words, to punish them, and to punish, punish those who did what? Go to verse 9. And scorched them with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power. Um, I've lost my place. Yeah, verse 9. Who has power over the plagues and did not repent to give him glory. Uh, so here's the stubbornness. Uh, as, the, as wrath is being executed, they continue on blaspheming God. They don't turn back and they give no glory to God. It's those who have bowed to the pressure. So you think if you're still living, that, that, uh, and you're living in the time of Domitian, John is trying to give you a picture. Those that have been killed for Christ are sitting, standing on a sea of glass victorious. Those who bowed to the pressure are being scorched with the sun. Which one do you want to do? So when the pressure comes on, you make your choice. Do you want to remain faithful or do you want to, do you want to bow to the pressure? Because here's the picture. Which one do you want to be? Make sense? It's a simple message, couched in some difficult language. Anything else on the fourth bowl? We're going to have some practical things here that we want to get to here in just a moment as we, we wind the chapter down in just a little bit. Um, let's go to the fifth bowl. On the throne of the beast, verses 10 and 11. What happens here?
All right. So the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Now, where do we find any information about who the beast is? Where do we see him before? Chapter 13. So here was the beast of the, the, uh, the earth and the beast of the sea. It obviously refers to the first beast, uh, which would be, we identified as being the Roman emperor. Uh, and if our dating be correct, that would be Domitian. Uh, so the, it's poured out on the throne and his kingdom became full of darkness. The bottom line is this, this bowl of wrath is pointing to the fall of the Roman emperor, the one that people seem to fear so much. We're going to bow to the pressure. We're going to burn incense and say Caesar is Lord because we're so fearful of him. Well, he's going to fall. But let's go back now to chapter 15 and verse 7. Our God lives forever and ever. He's going to fall. That's the point of verse. Uh, but his kingdom is going to be full of darkness. Now, notice in verses 10 and 11, um, end of verse 10, they gnawed on their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. What are you learning from that? Say again. All right, it's full of evil and sin. What did you say, Stephen? Yeah. They're not going to, it doesn't matter what consequence, what consequence they know they're going to face or they're facing at the present. They're not going to change, and these did not. But I'm learning from that that those in, the, in, those in his kingdom are going to suffer because of what he did and led them to do. His kingdom becomes darkness. Do you want to identify with Domitian? His kingdom is going to be turned to darkness. His lights are going out. That's the point. God's going to turn his lights out. And uh, he's going to take this king down and this emperor down and turn the lights out in the kingdom. Do you want to be in that kingdom? Do you want to bow to the pressure? Or do you want to... Uh, Submit to the God of heaven. That's the point. The fall of the Roman emperor, I think, is the point. All right, let's go to the sixth bowl now. Now, at the sixth bowl, we have verses 12 to 16, and we have a little more information here than we have in some of the others, and it gets a little more exciting, at least, if uh, particularly to the premillennials, they try to get excited here, and there's nothing to be terribly excited about. So what do we have in the sixth bowl? All right, the great river Euphrates is dried up so that the kings from the east can easily come across. Well, uh, again, that's not a literal uh, picture of the, the Euphrates drying up, but in a vision, anything's possible. The enemies of God people were always from the east. I say always, generally from the east. Assyria was from the, from the east. And so was Babylon from the east. And so were the Parthians who invaded Rome, they also came from the east. So here's a picture of external invasion. We've talked about internal rottenness, and here's also external invasion. How's God going to bring this kingdom down? He allows another kingdom to, to come in and, and attack them when they thought they were uh, invincible. Well, then notice at verse 13 to 16, there were three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, who is the devil, and the beast, the Roman emperor, and the mouth of the false prophets, those who submit, or something that may have reference to the Roman concilia that we talked about in chapter 13, the second beast. So these evil or unclean spirits are functioning like generals preparing kings for battle, ga gathering men to battle. And notice at verse 14, deception is used. We've already talked about that. Uh, that the spirits were performing signs and they go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them into battle in the day of the great God Almighty. Now, verse 15, what's the warning? This is not about the final judgment, but it's judgment in time on Rome. God's warning is, be ready. I'm coming as a thief, just as he is in the second coming. It's going to suddenly come, and this destruction comes, and blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. What does he mean? Yeah, and stay pure and faithful. And he uses an illustration, though, to say if you don't, you're going to be like. 
going to be exposed. You're going to be naked walking around and be ashamed. Uh, so do you want to you take care of your garments? In other words, stay pure. Or you're going to be stripped naked and you're going to be walking around. Not literally, but it's the idea of being embarrassed and shamed because you, you didn't take, take heed to the warning. And they shall be gathered together in a place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. What's the big deal about Armageddon? And, and, and if you throw that out in the world, if we were broadcasting to the world and we said, let's talk about Armageddon, what would be the reaction? Yeah. yeah the premillen- you're right. The premillennialists think that that is a final battle and every time we do have something like going on right now, the, the war between Hamas and Israel, this could be leading to Armageddon. There's going to be a final war that brings the world to an end. Uh, there's nothing like that in the New, New Testament or Old Testament either for that matter. Let's talk about Armageddon. It literally means the mountain of Megiddo. The American Standard translates that Harmageddon, Harmageddon, um, meaning the mountain of Megiddo. Now, what was Megiddo? Well, here is a map of Palestine, and we're going to focus in right in this area. But notice here, this is Manasseh. Here we have Ephraim, Manasseh, and then here's Issachar and Zebulon and so on. Let's zoom in a little bit here uh, and focus on Megiddo. There was a pass at Megiddo where many decisive battles were fought. And we have reference to that in Jude, uh, uh, Judges 5 and 2 Kings 9 and 2 Chronicles 35. It just simply stands for a decisive battle. That, that there is this conflict between God and Satan, conflict between Rome and the Parthians, as we're going to men- as mentioned in this context. There's going to be a decisive battle that does not say anything about future judgments that are coming in the sense that there's going to be some kind of war that breaks out. The battle is no more literal than the frogs are generals. If this is a literal battle, we have literal frogs serving as generals in the army. That's not going to work. Questions or comments about Megiddo? Because of, it was so many battles there. Good point. All right, let's go to the seventh bowl. We've got a couple of minutes. Let's get this one and we will be done. The seventh bowl was poured out in the air and there was a loud voice that said, it is done. The judgment is complete. Remember the number seven, completion. So here it is complete. With the seventh one poured out, it's done. It's over. Now there was noises and thundering and lightning and a great earthquake like has never been before. That may simply symbolize the power of God by which this was all accomplished. That God is the one that brought Rome down. It's over, it's finished, it's done. Their lights are turned out. Now verses 19 to 21, this has to do with the the effect of this. There's going to be the total collapse that the city was divided into three parts. That may suggest the total collapse of of the city of Rome and the nation of Rome. Uh, Verse 20, every island fled away and the mountains were not to be found. In other words, there's no refuge. It's not a place where where the Roman emperor or the Roman government could could go seek for refuge and and come back and they're they're back in business. Not at all. Uh, It's all over. And so the judgment is final. Now, so what's the point of chapter 16? God's wrath being executed on Rome. We saw the victorious saints on the Sea of Glass 15. Now we see God's judgment is executed upon Rome. So whether you walk away with, okay, I think the first one is talking about uh, internal rottenness, and I think the last one is talking about external invasion. You say, I don't see any of that. All I see is a general picture. You've got a good picture. You've got a good picture. If you walk away with seven bowls, I don't know what they represent it, don't know what they mean. I just know it means God brought judgment upon Rome. You got the picture. You got it. Make sense? Practical lessons. We might have time for one or two. Practical things you take home with you. Yeah, all of our conflicts, all of our problems, 
we're dealing with temporary things. Good point. What else? The enemy will not win. Enemy will not win. God will make sure of that. One more. Let's get one more. Good point. We'll stop with that 17 and 18 next time.